Okay, uh, what I'm going to do in this segment, first I want to clean up some of the questions left over from the last segment. I had a young man over here who was too embarrassed to come up and ask his question, so he slipped it to me, a little note here. And it's kind of an intelligent question. He wants to know, how old is the court system? There's only one profession older than the legal profession. <laughs> okay, does that tell you anything? Uh, the oldest one that I am familiar with that I know anything about is the Mosaic Code. Uh, it was known at the time of Christ when it got some really bad press because they had some really bad people in it. It was, it was not the fault of the institution. It was the uh, people running it as we see the country today here. It's called the Great Sanhedrin. It consisted of 23 priests, 23 scribes, 23 elders, and two presiding officers. There were 71 judges. This has been true since the time of Moses. And uh, here's the funny thing about this. The reason, the 71 is kind of a strange number because it's the number of judges that they had in Israel before the time of Christ, at the time of Christ, all the way up until the time the Romans flattened the place in 70 AD. But it's also the number of books that are supposed to be in the Bible. In the King James, you only have 66. But there were five others mentioned in an Arab book called the Muqwatama by Ibn Khaldun that was finished in 1377. And back in 1377, even the Muslims knew that the Bible was supposed to have 71 books. And for evidence of this, uh, I would suggest that you go back and study the history of what was taken out of the Bible when, because, for example, 1st and 2nd Maccabees were even in the 1st King James Bibles all the way up to at least 1640. I mean, I've seen a 1640 King James Bible, and it had 1st and 2nd Maccabees in it. There's also another one that's called the Book of Clement that was taken out by the uh, Pope in about the 10th century because it described the phoenix, uh, this thing that rose from the ashes every 500 years. It described worlds beyond the seas. And the Pope looked at that and said, oh, this can't possibly be. So he flushed that one too. And then there's a couple other ones that are in there. But anyway, in answer to this young man's question, the court system uh, that I'm familiar with goes all the way back to the time of Moses. and uh, the court systems before that, you know, I already got a laugh out of you, which I didn't expect. Thank you. <laughs> and uh, anyway, the next question I had, I'm, I have a gentleman here that's got a question. Then we're going to get right into constitutional law, what it is, what it isn't, how to make it work for you, that sort of thing. Going to have to give you the basics. I got two, more, at least two more questions. A lady came up and asked me to explain the Desert Fox because apparently there's some of you here who are not that familiar with the history of the Second World War. Uh, Erwin Rommel, he was the youngest general in the German army during World War II. Uh, he beat the British time after time in the deserts of North Africa until he was simply finally crushed, not by superior generalship, but by superior numbers uh, at El Alamein. Now, the reason they call him the Desert Fox is because this individual, and you'll see part of a letter to his wife in the beginning of my book, The Erwin Rommel School of Law, uh, what he said was he took the rule book and he ignored most of it and he wrote his own rules. Now I'm going to teach you how to do that to a certain extent, but you've got to be very careful here because, and the reason we call this the Erwin Rommel School of Law is because, actually it started as a joke in Minnesota, I just walked out one day and I realized what I was doing was teaching military tactics in civil court proceedings and in criminal court proceedings to some extent. And I just said, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the Erwin Rommel School of Law. It just came off the top of my head and Peter adopted it and ran with it. But it does fit because Erwin Rommel was not only the youngest general in the German army, he was one of the most brilliant. And he did things that no one else did. For example, your normal uh, uh, American or British commander, they'd stay back in a bunker someplace and they'd look at maps and they'd order people around. Well, Erwin Rommel was in the lead tank. And he pulled various stunts staying within the framework of the rules, uh, the known rules of warfare, but then going outside them to some extent. He did not make up his own rules from the jump because if you do that, for example, if you say, well, okay, I'm going to try something they've, we've never done before. Everybody turn the turret of his tank around backwards and fire, obviously you're going to lose. <laughs> but that anyway, Erwin Rommel, there, there are several books on him, uh, The Desert Fox. Uh, somehow or another he got involved in an assassination plot against Adolf Hitler and they gave him a choice of 
he could check out, commit suicide immediately, or they're going to drag his family into it. And he was uh, all man all the way to the end. He said, okay, he said, give me whatever I need to take. He said, I'll be dead in 20 minutes. And he did. He checked out just like that. Now, the next thing, I've got one more question here. Yes, sir. I wanted to get back uh, to what the other gentleman had brought up about implementing regulation. Uh, I understood what you were saying about uh, Title 18, but uh, I have used it uh, implementing regulations successfully against the IRS both for myself and uh, representing a friend of mine and it worked. Now did it work because they're too stupid to know any difference or is it actually right? Well let me ask for you this. Lack, lack of implementing regulations. No, no, you may, have been, you may have been 300 percent correct but my first question to you is did you use this inside or outside of the court system? It was in meetings in their office. We okay, never made whoa, whoa, it to court. stop. Okay, see now here's what you're talking about. You apparently intimidated these people to the point that they didn't want to mess with you, all right? That does not mean you're necessarily going to win it if you take it to a federal court. It doesn't mean you're going to lose it either, all right? There are some statutes, and you have to read. Now, here's something else I've got to point out. I had a man come up to me during a break, and he showed me his indictment. Well, that's one of my specialties is federal criminal cases. I love federal criminal cases because I can almost always find out some way to wreck a federal judge's career in the process of this guy's case. Okay. Well, you think I'm kidding. Uh, there's a couple of stories I could tell you on that. Uh, I think I probably better save them. But uh, anyway, you have to learn to read the statute itself closely. In other words, let's say you've got Title 18, Section 371. It says, whoever defrauds the United States government. Title Section A is a felony, Section B is a misdemeanor. Well, man said, well, look, he said, uh, I'm not a government employee. How does this statute apply to me? I said, you see any place in a statute that says you've got to be a government employee to get bagged on this clunker? Uh-uh. You've got to learn to read this stuff closely. When you read a statute, and believe me, the prosecutors don't read them, the judges don't read them. Remember the ultimate four-letter word for attorneys? Okay, read. read. All right. The judges don't read this stuff. The attorneys don't read this stuff. I mean, it's amazing. What goes on in the American court system? Because these idiots don't read anything. Well, if you read the statute and you say, wait a minute, this doesn't apply to me or it does apply to me, the statute itself would have to say that if they're bagging you on it, that the agency has the ability to implement a regulation. If the statute does not say that and the agency does that, they are expanding the statute. They don't have an authority to do that. It's a due process violation. You get a judge that's even halfway doing his job, you can get, get it thrown out. Okay, is that it? That pretty well tells you what you want to know? Okay, the, the last part, I didn't quite understand that. Okay, you cannot expand a statute. In mm -hmm. other words, if the statute says that everybody has to wear green hats, that statute does not say that pink is optional. Mm -hmm. All right? right? And the minute that a prosecutor says, well, you weren't wearing a pink stripe in your green hat, well, the green hat statute does not carry a pink stripe clause, all right? That's expanding a statute. And when you do that, the court's lost jurisdiction. Of course, you're going to have to fight like a tiger to explain that to them because, and let me explain jurisdiction while we're at it. Um, a lot of people got this idea that you can go into court and say, well, you only have jurisdiction if I give it to you. Now, let me explain jurisdiction. Jurisdiction is you and I go into a convenience store and there's one six pack of beer left up there and I want it and you want it now you've got your ID you've got your cash you've got your credit card I mean you're copacetic you've got everything you legally need I have a 44 Magnum and it's loaded you can see the bullets in it now my question to you is which one of us has jurisdiction <laughs> bingo okay learn that's how the court system works all right no these these judges are normally so stupid and corrupt, they cannot be made to understand anything unless you can hurt them. And if you can, that's like I said, that's why I love federal criminal cases, because you'll never find a federal judge on a federal criminal case that has the slightest conception of how the federal constitution or the statute law is supposed to work, and half of them have substance abuse problems. In fact, I want to cover that just real briefly. Anybody here study graphology, handwriting analysis? Excellent, okay. Did you ever read Andre McNichol's book? Handwriting, handwriting analysis, okay. Do you remember what she says about people whose letters overlap each other? Okay, watch this. 
Now this is exaggerated. Okay, now that's John. But you see how the letters overlap each other? You'll find about half the judges in the United States, when they sign a document, their letters overlap each other. It's a sign of mental confusion. <laughs> All right? Am I right? Okay. It's normally caused by substance abuse. And whenever you see that, you realize you're dealing with some guy that you're going to have to hurt to straighten him out because he's too stupid to reason with. In fact, what I use when I'm dealing with judges, it's called the amoeba principle. You know, amoeba is a very simple organism. You can only get it to move one of two ways. You either have to inflict pain or you have to deprive it of nourishment. Now, if you inflict pain on an amoeba, it will, work, it will move away from the source of pain. If you have deprived it of nourishment, it will move towards the source of food. And if you try to get past that, dealing with the people who run this legal system, I can tell you right now, you're doomed to a lifetime of bitter disappointment. You've got to be able to hurt these people, and I'm going to show you how. Now, do you have any more questions before I get into constitutional law? Okay. I, <clears throat> I think I understand what, what you're saying, but just to be clear, on the, uh, like in, in uh, Internal Revenue Code, the distraint statutes, uh, liens and levies, those, the implementing regulation that falls in behind, those are in 27, which is ATF. Now, the statute in, in 26 doesn't really say anything other than be extremely vague. Okay, you're talking, okay, yeah, man over here brought up a point. He says the secretary has to issue implementing regulations. And there are some statutes in Title 26 that says such a document must be signed by the secretary, and you always get one that's signed by some lower Slobovian slob, all right. Yeah, you can, you can argue that on a due process issue, but we're getting ahead of ourselves. Okay, okay let's park that one for a while. Wait till I get up to the Fifth Amendment. Okay, now. Let's get into constitutional law. Everybody that, I must have had 14 people ask me how to spell Krulowicz. Luckily for me, it's in the back of the book. Uh, we're going to get into constitutional law next, but I've got to show you just exactly what the Constitution says and how it works. The first thing I've got to disabuse you of is this notion that it has any definite meaning in the hands of today's Supreme Court. What I'm going to give you here is a paragraph out of a case called Adamson versus People of State of California. This is a 1947 Supreme Court case. You think it's bad now, or it was bad then, now it's, just, it's a complete abortion, but I'm going to show you how to deal with that. They're referring to an earlier case called Twining versus New Jersey, which was adjudicated approximately 1906. And what I want to do here is when I give you this particular paragraph, I'm not going to give you the citations on it, is I'm going to show you what the Supreme Court did with the 14th Amendment. Now, I know a lot of you think the 14th Amendment is a bad amendment. It's actually the best one in the bunch if you know how to use it. And here it is, Adamson versus People of California. For those who want the cite, it's in the 67th volume of the Supreme Court Reporter, page 1672. In the Twining opinion, the court explicitly declined to give way to the historical demonstration that the first section of the amendment, and they're talking about the 14th Amendment here, was intended to apply to the states the several protections of the Bill of Rights. It held that the question was, quote, no longer open, unquote, because of previous decisions of this court, and they're talking about the Supreme Court, which, however, had not appraised the historical evidence on that subject. The court admitted that its action had resulted in giving, quote, much less effect to the 14th Amendment than some of the public men active in framing it, unquote, had intended it to have. Now, you'll find this quote on page 1687 of Adamson versus State of California. Do you realize what I just read here? In other words, these morons running the Supreme Court, and we're going all the way back to the end of the 19th century and the beginning of the 20th, had no respect for the people who framed the Constitution, for the statutes enacted by Congress, for the historical evidence. I mean, these nine little despots actually think that they're the ones enacting all our laws, every one of them. Did you read them the site? Yes, or I did. Okay. Yes, I did. Okay, now, what I'm going to give you here is an earlier, and this is, this is from not 1947, this is from 1937 in a case called 
West Coast Hotel Company versus Parrish. In the 57th volume of the Supreme Court Reporter, the case starts at page 578. Here's the quote from page 587. And there's a kicker to this one. This is from 10 years before. The judicial function is that of interpretation. It does not include the powers of amendment under the guise of interpretation. To miss the point of difference between the two is to miss all that the phrase, quote, supreme law of the land, quote, stands for, and to convert what was intended as inescapable and endorsing mandates into mere moral reflections. You know, the sad part about this is this was a dissenting opinion. It's not law. It's what the judge who was saying, hey, all you other characters are wrong, but these other people did not care. Now, the reason that they do this is because the last time, and I'm going to show you how to do this too, the last time a federal judge was disciplined for trampling the rights of an American citizen was the impeachment, trial, and conviction of Judge John Pickering. I mean, this guy didn't go to jail, he just lost his job. On March the 12th, 1804, in other words, we, yeah, we have a whole society, we have a whole segment of our society that is completely lost to the meaning of the word discipline, okay? Now, when I get into the basic constitution, now I've got to caution you on something. A lot of the constitution, the body of it, is no longer applicable, not because that it's been undermined or anything, but quite frankly, it's been amended. Here's one that has it. Let's go to Article 1. This is the legislative power, all right? And let's go to section one. All legislative powers herein granted shall be vested in a Congress of the United States, which shall consist of a Senate and House of Representatives. This is a key phrase, ladies and gentlemen. All legislative powers herein granted. If the power wasn't granted, they don't have it, okay? Except that we're back to our jurisdictional argument. They've got the 44 Magnum. And later on, I'm going to show you how to take it away from them, okay? And uh, I've done it in one case, and I'm about to do it in another one. All right, now, let's go to Article 1, Section 7. All bills for raising revenue shall originate in the House of Representatives. Well, if you want to know where all this nonsense comes from, it doesn't all come from the House of Representatives. Next thing we're going to, a lot of this stuff in between here, it's either been amended or it doesn't concern us at this point. Okay? Here is what does concern you. You are about to learn in the next five minutes the difference between a constitutional law and an unconstitutional law. Okay? And the difference is this, is that we go all the way down to Section 8, and we are still in Article 1. And we're going to go to clauses, from clauses, Section 1 through 18. It's going to be 1, 2, and all the way down to 18. Now, 18 is merely the enabling clause. It simply says that Congress shall have the power to take care of the other 17. I can't quote you the exact words right off the top of my head. But it simply says that what you'll have is a... Uh, hang on a second here while I fumble all over the place looking for... Uh, the, yeah, here we go, Section 8. Okay. We've got, I've skipped in cases of impeachment, but that's for congressmen. You can throw them out every two years anyway. All right. What I'm going to do is I'm going to go line by line here, and I'm going to show you how this is supposed to work. Now, on 18, the exact wording is to make all laws. This is the power given to Congress at the end of Section 8. To make all laws which shall be necessary and proper for carrying into execution the foregoing powers and all other powers vested by this Constitution in the government of the United States or in any department or officer thereof. All right? Uh, now, Congress has limited authority on paper. Uh, in real life, because we keep electing idiots, they behave according to form, and what we get are idiots who do not understand how this is supposed to work. Let's take each segment of the federal Constitution here and I'm going to show you how it works and what they cannot use it for. And then when we get to the end of it, what you're going to recognize is, hey, wait a minute. Congress did not have this power. But they enacted these laws anyway. 
And we'll show you how those conflict with various guarantees of the bills of rights. Let's go with uh, Section 8, Clause 1. The Congress shall have power to lay and collect taxes, duties, imposts, and excises to pay the debts and provide for the common defense and general welfare of the United States. But all duties, imposts, and excises shall be uniform throughout the United States. Now, there's Supreme Court case law from the 19th century, and I believe there's even quite a bit from this century that point out that it says Congress shall have the power to lay and collect taxes for these purposes. It does not say Congress has the power to legislate for these purposes. And it absolutely does not say that Congress has the power to pay the debts of Mexico, to provide for the common defense of Israel, and the general welfare of every nation on earth. There's no place here that says that. Every congressman who has voted for every bill that conflicts with Section 8, Clause 1 here, has violated his oath of office to uphold the Constitution of the United States and should be subject to impeachment. The only problem is, how do you impeach 535 people, almost all of whom are equally guilty? The only way you can do that is throw them out at the ballot, which I'm also going to show you. Number two, to borrow money on the credit of the United States. Well, we don't even have to get into that. Uh, number three, to regulate commerce with foreign nations and among the several states and with the Indian tribes. Now you'll notice that almost all federal laws, whether they're narcotics laws, they're gun laws, anything like that, they invoke the Interstate Commerce Clause. But as almost any semi-competent law professor will tell you, and I've got a lengthy quote from one of them in my Erwin Rommel book, is that Congress was not given, nor have they ever had, the authority to regulate things that have passed in interstate commerce after they've come to a screeching halt. They don't have that authority. It's just that what they're doing is whenever Congress feels like enacting a law, they say, oh, it affects interstate commerce. It's like, you know, it's like kind of a catch-all, like treason at the time of the Roman Empire. Uh, number four, to establish a uniform rule of naturalization and uniform laws on the subject of bankruptcies throughout the United States. Well, one of those uh, uniform laws on naturalization was if you made it in and you got across the Rio Grande and you made it in across the border a few years back, you had amnesty. That's hardly uniform. All right. And as far as the subject of bankruptcies, see this clause here, all bankruptcies are federal. Now the reason they're federal is for the same reason I gave you earlier, is that the bankruptcy laws are set up not to protect the consumer or the common citizen. They are set up to protect the large banks, the financiers, the, the big corporations. Because the fact is, is if you have people in a state legislature and you have a whole bunch of people going belly up, well, the people in the other 49 states don't pay that much attention. But if you had people in your own state, a lot of whom were getting hurt financially, and they said to their state legislatures, look, if you don't pass some debtor relief laws, we're going to throw you out. We're going to get someone else in. The job would get done. This particular clause, section four, or rather clause four of section eight, is in intent in direct conflict with Leviticus 25 verses 34 to 37. Number five, to coin money, regulate the value thereof and a foreign coin, and fix the standards of weights and measures. It doesn't say anything about it, it has to be gold and silver. We'll get into that a little later on. Uh, the fact is, is that gold and silver has got its own problems just like paper money does, one of which was at the time of the Spanish plate fleets leaving South America where they were stealing all the gold from all the Indians, is that the only thing that happened in Western Europe is every time a fleet docked in Spain with another load of gold, price of everything doubled. Uh, the only difference is between gold and paper money is it just takes longer to inflate the currency supply. Number six. Now I want you to compare number six to number one here. To provide for the punishment of counterfeiting the securities and current coin of the United States. In other words, in the original Constitution, Congress was given the power to enact criminal penalties for counterfeiting. Uh, the penalties we have were not anywhere near as severe as they were in England under the common law. Because under the common law, it was, a, it was considered treason and it was an executable offense. They would actually hang you for coin clipping, counterfeiting, anything like that. Now you notice. Going back here to section one, where it says Congress shall have the power to lay and collect taxes, there's nothing in there that says Congress shall have the power to punish for the non-payment of taxes, because that was by civil process all the way up until about 1926. Number seven, to establish post offices and post roads. 
Well, we all know that's not workable, and the reason that they enacted this originally, it's kind of an obsolete uh, part of the Constitution, is because at the time, the only people carrying the mail were the military. They were the only ones strong enough to get past hostile Indians and the rest. Number eight, to promote the progress of science and useful arts by securing for limited times to authors and inventors the exclusive right to their respective writings and discoveries. We still have that, patents and copyrights. Number nine. Boy, this is one that, uh, this is one of my unfavorites. To constitute tribunals inferior to the Supreme Court. In other words, Congress can enact just any type of judiciary they want to adjudicate the federal laws. And one of the ironies here is uh, in the early 19th century, Congress figured, well, if they could create these tribunals, they could also dissolve them. And they tried. And the Supreme Court says, no, you can't. Once you've got them, you're stuck with them. And uh, so that didn't go anywhere. Ten, to define and punish piracies and felonies committed on the high seas and offenses against the law of nations. Uh, well, piracy, uh, obviously you have to have a navigable waterway. There aren't a whole lot of them here in Texas that I'm aware of. Uh, of course, I've got to warn you here, if you go out and, what is this, this river they've cut out here? If you swim out there and steal somebody's boat, that's piracy. It's a federal offense. It carries 99 years. So if you're going to steal something, stay out of the water. 11, to declare war, grant letters of mark and reprisal, and make rules concerning captures on land and water. Well, this is no longer feasible because when this was first written, private individuals could put a boat together, throw a few cannon on it, and go out there and prey on enemy shipping. Uh, that doesn't work anymore. Nobody can afford an aircraft carrier uh, or a destroyer these days, except the government. 12, to raise and support armies, but no appropriation of money to that use shall be for a longer term than two years. Now the reason they put this in here is because what they were terrified of at the time the Constitution was written was a professional standing army like the one we've had since 1972. Uh, they knew that if ordinary citizens got military training went in and out, the odds of somebody being able to control a professional standing army were also almost zero. And if that didn't work, if they had had a budget enacted for two years, the army could do for whatever it wanted for 24 months, and in that 24 months, they're out of money. They couldn't do anything. 13, to provide and maintain a navy. 14, to make rules for the government and regulation of the land and naval forces. And you'll find in some of these Second Amendment Law Journal articles, they show that this statute, if understood as it is understood by these goofy courts we have these days, would make the Second Amendment a nullity. In other words, they've already got the authority to regulate uh, land and naval forces. Second Amendment was not enacted to make sure that we had a standing army. It was to make sure people could protect themselves from whatever standing army the government had. And there's an interesting little aside here. One of the reasons they had to crush Waco, which I don't know if anyone has caught yet, is, and we're talking about not the, not the siege of 51 days, because fact is federal government's always going to come up with superior forces in the long run. But it was the first time since the Custer Massacre in 1876 that federal land forces had been defeated on American soil. And they were not going to let that one stand. Eight, number 15, and this also bears on the Second Amendment. Compare this to the language of the Second Amendment, and you'll see that if the Second Amendment was understood as the courts understand it, it would be superfluous. To provide for calling forth the militia to execute the laws of the Union, suppress insurrections, and repel invasions. Because if it was understood the way the courts understood it, if the militia was in fact the National Guard and the Army Reserves, then George Bush would have had no authority, neither would Lyndon Johnson or Richard Nixon, to pull people out of these reserve units and send them to Vietnam or the Persian Gulf. In other words, that would have been an absolute breach of the federal constitution right there. Number 16, we're again still on the Second Amendment or the corollary to it to provide for organizing, arming, and discipline, disciplining the militia and for governing such, part of, governing such part of them as may be employed in the service of the United States, reserving to the states respectively the appointment of the officers and the authority of training the militia according to the discipline prescribed by Congress. 17, to exercise exclusive legislation in all cases whatsoever over such district, not exceeding 10 miles square, as may, by session of particular states and the acceptance of Congress, 
become the seat of the government of the United States and to exercise like authority over all places purchased by the consent of the legislature of the state in which this, the same shall be for the erection of forts, magazines, arsenals, dockyards, and other needful buildings. And, and then that's number 18. 18 is the one I already showed you where Congress has the authority. Now, do you see anything in there that allows the federal Congress to enact general criminal statutes? They don't have that authority. The problem is, is that when you build a guided missile cruiser and you stuff it with chimpanzees, which is what we've got at the federal level, you're going to have a shipwreck. In other words, the machinery is not going to work properly. A few other things here. Let's go to um, Section 9. Number 2. Wait a minute. This is... Uh, all right, here's this Section 8, number 1. It's something about... It's got like $10 for each person admitted. That no longer applies, obviously. Number 2. The privilege of the writ of habeas corpus shall not be suspended unless when in cases of rebellion or invasion the public safety may require it. Well, there's a case called McCleskey versus Zant in which the Supreme Court actually did su suspend the writ of habeas corpus. And the way they did it is they said, you've got one chance, and if you don't make it, you don't make it out that time, you can't ever submit another one. Uh, and you're going to find almost anything in here I can show you. I, I've done it in the book. Obviously, I'm not going to do it here today because we don't need to go into it that thoroughly. Um, there is about a 15% overlap about what I'm showing you here and what's in the book. What I'm going to try to do here is, is get your thought processes going, and then once that happens, I'm going to show you how to legislate, or I'm sorry, uh, how to litigate this particular thing. Number three, uh, no bill of attainder or ex post facto law shall be passed. Well, the problem with uh, bill of attainder is that that really doesn't have a lot of... Uh, applicability in our society because that went like corruption of blood and uh, it's very well explained in, uh, in Blackstones. But as far as um, ex post facto law, now what that means is that if you have done something, the state considers a criminal act, but if you did it before the legislature said that it was a criminal act, then you cannot be punished for it because there's no law saying and these people understood then that you're supposed to be able to know the future, and which is basically what ex post facto consists of. The other thing is, is that if you do an act that is criminal and punishable by, say, X number of years in prison, let's say you've got an act. I had a case down here not too long ago. Uh, when this fellow did, was accused of doing this thing, and the, this is one of these cases in which the, uh, the, neither the judge nor the prosecutor bothered to read the statute, and what he did did not fit within the statute. So when I got to looking at that, I thought, wait a minute, and he was really concerned because he had a license he didn't want to lose with a felony conviction. Now, he had done this particular act, or I should say he was accused of doing this particular act because, again, it didn't fit the statute. And when he did this particular act, or when he was, the time frame that he was accused, the um, statute was a felony. But after he was charged with this nonsense, the state legislature reduced it to a misdemeanor. And his attorney told him, well, when you did it, it was a, uh, it was a felony. Now, you've got to understand something here. Ex post facto means that you cannot increase the punishment, all right? And it also means that you cannot hold somebody responsible for a law that did not exist. Now, on the other hand, when a law is repealed, in other words, when you take a statute that was once a felony, all right, let's say it was a felony in 1994. It's now a misdemeanor in 1995. And you've got an attorney trying to scare the bejeebers out of you, saying, well, you know, you're going to have, I can get you a misdemeanor deal because if you go to trial, you're going to get bagged on a felony. On the contrary, if the state legislature reduced it to a misdemeanor, that's not ex post facto, that's repeal. And once a statute is repealed, I'll give you an example, the Volstead Act, uh, during, the, uh, during Prohibition, there were certain statutes that were enacted that said, yeah, they could prosecute you after the law was repealed, but most of them, from 1933 on, if you had committed, let's say you were bootlegging in 1932 and they caught you in 1934, statute was repealed. There wasn't anything you could do about it, even though you made your money and went on down the road. Now, Section 10, that's the one I addressed earlier, 
about uh, no law impairing the obligation of contracts or grant any title of nobility. Uh, and you know, it's funny because a lot of people run around, they think they're sovereign citizens. And the fact is, we're all peons, we're peasants. But the judges have given themselves, quote, sovereign immunity, unquote. I want to show you how to get around that. Uh, but that only goes for money damages. In other words, the, uh, the judges have basically promoted themselves to the level of nobility, and all the rest of us are mere peasants. Now, Article 2, this is the, uh, the legis I'm sorry, this is the executive. And the executive, we're not going to pay a whole lot of attention to, simply because the only thing that really concerns us here is Article 2, Section 1, Clause 8, which a gentleman brought to my attention earlier, is the oath to support the Constitution. And Section 4 is removal from office or impeachment for and conviction of treason, bribery, or other high crimes and misdemeanors. Almost never happens in the executive department. Now let's get to my favorite people here. Let's get to the judiciary. Because these people, as Thomas, Je Thomas Jefferson once said, are the miners and sappers of the republic. Article 3, it's not a, not a very long article. There's not a whole lot uh, uh, we really need to go into it. But I got, a, I got a riddle for you here. And maybe some of you jury nullification. How many people here are not familiar with jury nullification? Okay, one, two, three, not very many. All right, four. Okay, jury nullification simply means that the jury has the absolute right not only to decide the facts in the case, but also if the law should be enforced. Because what's happened in the last century, since 1895, in a case called Sparf and Hansen versus United States, is the judges have been telling the people on the jury, you are here to judge the facts. You must obey the law as I give it to you. Now, if you read the dissent in that 1895 Supreme Court case, Sparf and Hansen versus United States, the citation is given in my book. What you find is, is the two dissenting justices are saying, hey, wait a minute, this is nonsense. You've completely changed the meaning of what impartial jury means. Now, here's my question to you. Most of you are familiar with jury nullification. This is from Article 3. Now, this is the main body of the Constitution. And this is Section 3. The trial of all crimes except in cases of impeachment, shall be by jury. And such trial be held in the state where the said crimes shall have been committed. But when not committed within any state, the trial shall be at such place or places at the Congress as the Congress may by law have directed. Now, if the trial of all crimes shall be by jury, my question to you is this. What do they mean in the Sixth Amendment? Why do we have to have a jury trial guarantee in the Sixth Amendment when it's already here under Judiciary? Article 3, Clause 3. Can anybody answer that one for me? No takers? Good, because you're not going to find out until I get to the Sixth Amendment. I'll explain it to you. Okay? Let's go to Article 4. Because now some of this, we're going to be going downhill on this here. Article 4, this is the, in fact, let me, let me get it up here because this is, this is relatively important. Article 4, 2, 2, 2, 2, okay. Just extrapolate this over here. Article 4, let's go with Section 1. It's a full faith and credit clause. It means that if you have a court order that was issued in the state of Missouri, it must be accepted by the states of Florida. And, and so forth and so on. In other words, every state must recognize the legal processes in every other state. Okay? Now, section 2 is simply privileges and immunities and extradition. But Article 4, this is the one that's, most, that's mostly used. It's called the Full Faith and Credit Clause. Every judicial order, every judgment in every state must be given full faith and credit in every other state. Now, Section 4 of Article 4 guarantees to every state a Republican form of government. And you know there's never been any case adjudicated on this because a lot of people make a lot of this out but all it actually meant was it was mostly to protect against invasion from foreign powers where they would set up a monarchy and the reason that they stuck this in here 
is because Rhode Island kind of uh, got it in their heads that uh, if they didn't get treated right, they were going to invite some foreign power in like France or England or whatever so they'd get a toehold. And the people in the other states says, wrong oh, that's not going to happen. So that's not even a justiciable issue. You'll never find a court case where it's mentioned. Article 5. Now, Article 5 describes how the Constitution is to be amended. It has to be done by two-thirds of both houses. In other words, that's where you have to get it on the ballot, the, the House of Representatives and the Senate. And then, once you have it there and it's on the ballot, it has to be ratified by three-fourths of the states. Now, you cannot, and here's what the Supreme Court and the Congress have been doing for a long, long time. The Supreme Court, as I pointed out earlier, does not have the authority to amend the Constitution, even though they've given it to themselves. And there is a way to deal with this. The Congress cannot, merely by legislating, amend the Constitution. They've been doing this too. And there's also a way to deal with this. Let's go to Article 6. And if I'm going too fast for you, just tell me, whoa, and I'll slow down. Or we'll get some questions here. Article 6, Clause 2 is what is called the Supremacy Clause. And what that says is that the United States Constitution is the supreme law of the land. Anything in any state or anywhere else, to the contrary, notwithstanding. In other words, the Constitution is the supreme law of the United States. Uh, at least that's the way it's supposed to be. Then the next thing down is the statutes enacted by Congress. Article 6, Clause 3 is the oath of office that everybody has to take to support the federal constitution. And it's kind of funny here because when they take that oath, including state judges, they're taking an oath to support the entire constitution, including the amendments. But those same state judges will tell you, oh, you can proceed on a prosecutor's information instead of a grand jury indictment. But they already took an oath to support the whole Constitution. So what you're going to see is, is if you were impeaching every judge at the state level for a violation of an oath of office, there wouldn't be any. Article 7, ratification. Now, Article 7, there are seven articles in the main body of the Constitution. Article 7 has no validity whatsoever. Because all it says is, is that any time you amend the Constitution, it has to be ratified by nine states. There were only 13 states at the time. So the first six sections of the Constitution, if you study them, if you look at them, if you use Blackstone's commentaries as your base, if you go from there, you'd be amazed at what you're going to come up with. Now, next thing I want to get into is the Bill of Rights. And we don't have a whole lot of time left, so in fact, we're going to break for lunch just any second now. So anybody got any questions? No questions? Okay, um, uh, here we go. <clears throat> we are uh, definitely going to break for lunch. And um, I might as well uh, hang my laundry out here uh, right in the middle because we have a couple of minutes. Uh, one of the things you paid for when you came in was this Title 42 binder. And it is with a uh, great amount of consternation that I announced to you that two of the briefs, uh, two of the three briefs have been misprinted. You are missing page six of the original complaint and you are missing page 10 of the reply brief. And therefore, you absolutely must, with metaphysical certitude, give me your name and address so I can supply you with these two pages. And I, am, I, I cannot tell you how embarrassed I am. I've been dealing with this printer for two years, and I've never had this problem. And um, uh, what can I tell you? If anything can go wrong, it will. Apparently, uh, Murphy has invaded the Erwin Rommel School of Law. I guess I'm real quick, Peter, that I want to say here, while you're at lunch, those of you who want to uh, talk law with each other, I've got a lunch date with a couple of gentlemen back here. They're gonna, they told me they're going to feed me everything I can eat, which uh, means they'll never be able to attend another seminar because they won't be able to afford it. <laughs> but what I'd like you to do is, I'm going to teach you how to do a statement of facts, or rather Peter is. What I want you to do is read the statement of facts because later on what we're going to do is I'm going to show you how not to do things. There are at least two sentences in there in the statement of facts in this complaint that are not facts. They're conclusory allegations. See if you can locate them. And then we'll discuss it after lunch. We'll finish the Constitution. Then we're going to get into, into a statute law. 
and I'm going to show you actually how to draft a complaint, how to serve it, and everything else. And, so, and we one. are the Erwin Rommel School of Law, 4842 North Magnolia, Chicago, 60640-4710. Our phone, 312-878-0681. Dedicated fax, 0682. And we'll see you after lunch. Thank you. The next thing I'm going to cover, we covered the body of the Constitution as I showed you. The last section of it has nothing to do with anything. Uh, there are some sections in there that are fairly critical. You should be able to tell the difference. I'm going to show you how to apply them in a bit. But first we've got to discuss the Bill of Rights. Otherwise in the hands of today's federal judiciary, known as the List of Suggestions, or if you print it on toilet paper you could call it the Bill of Wipes because in the hands of today's judges it doesn't mean a whole lot. Let's start with the first and dispense with that. First Amendment from 1791, Congress shall make no law respecting an establishment of religion or prohibiting the free exercise thereof or abridging the freedom of speech or of the press or the right of the people peaceably to assemble and to petition the government for a redress of grievances. Now, can anybody, by any twisted, tortured reasoning, show me where when it says Congress shall make no law, that the Supreme Court of the United States can take this particular amendment and twist it and bend it to where it's unconstitutional to have the Bible and the prayer in public and, and prayer in the public schools? Can anyone show me that? Remember what I said earlier about what the federal judiciary actually is, a priest of bail? They can't handle a competition. They don't care what the plain words on paper are. And there have been Supreme Court justices in the past who, said, who have stated that Congress shall make no law means precisely that. It does not give anyone any authority past that. The Second Amendment, the right to keep and bear arms, we have already discussed. The Third Amendment, that's no soldier shall in time of peace be quartered in any house without the consent of the owner or in time of war, but in a manner to be prescribed by law. Well, that's the only amendment, amendment that I know of that hasn't been violated of the first ten for the simple reason they've never had a housing shortage for soldiers in this country. You know, believe me, if they have one, they'll violate this one too. Now the Fourth Amendment, now this, is, this is going to be something where, watch this one because I'm going to show you the Fourth Amendment no longer exists. A little tedious, but bear with me. No person, I'm sorry, I started on five. Let's go back to four. The right of the people to be secure in their persons, houses, and papers, and effects against unreasonable searches and seizures shall not be violated. And no warrants shall issue but upon probable cause, supported by oath or affirmation, and particularly describing the place to be searched and the persons or things to be seized. Now let me tell you, show you what the judiciary has done with that. They have some doctrines that they've been using for a number of years. The first one, it's a 1971 Supreme Court case called Coolidge versus New Hampshire. And in that case the Supreme Court ruled that if a police officer had a search warrant and he barged into your house and he's looking for marijuana plants and marijuana plants are particularly described as the things to be seized 
and he happens to see a sawed-off shotgun in plain view, uh, bear those words in mind, plain view, that he can seize the shotgun and then use it as evidence against you. And what this has actually done is it has allowed uh, a lot of corrupt police officers in this country to get a search warrant based on any pretext, run into your house, and under the plain view doctrine, go into all your drawers, all your file cabinets, turn your place upside down. When they finally find something, oh, it was in plain view. Or even worse, and this has happened in a number of cases, when a police officer says, well, I c probably can't get a warrant for guns, but I can get one for drugs. He gets one for drugs, and he carries the weapon in with him. And he also found that in plain view. And I realize a lot of you think maybe I'm being a little hard on police, but the sad fact is we had no uniformed police in the United States until 1853 in New York. They were originally formulated to protect large corporations and act as strike breakers. Uh, they were never intended to protect the general public, and that's why we still kind of have this legacy today. Now, what you may have seen this uh, House resolution, uh, courtesy of Newt Gingrich, 666, you like those numbers? Uh, that's the one that says, well, if the police are operating in good faith, they can go into your house without a warrant. Now, who determines good faith? I mean, yeah, exactly. In other words, we're right back to the old British writs of assistance. When a British officer would come up to your house, knock on your door and say, hey, I'm here to search your house because I think you've done something wrong. You say, well, what did I do wrong? He says, oh, I don't know, but we're going to search your house and find out. And that's what we've come back to. The uh, fact is, is that unless something is done to these people in Congress who keep amending the Constitution, because that's exactly what House Resolution 666 is. It is an attempted amendment of the Fourth Amendment. And Newt Gingrich and the 300 people who signed their contract on America don't have that authority. And something you might want to consider in the next election uh, is that everybody who signed that signed a an oath to violate his oath of office. Next thing we're going to get to, and this is one of my favorites. This is the grand jury clause of the Fifth Amendment. Fifth Amendment. No person shall be held to answer for a capital or otherwise infamous crime unless on a presentment or indictment of a, of a grand jury. And then they give you the exceptions or in time of war, so forth and so on nor shall any person be subject for the same offense to, to be twice put in jeopardy of life or limb, nor shall be compelled in any criminal case to be a witness against himself, nor be deprived of life, liberty, or property without due process of law, nor shall private property be taking, taken for public use without just compensation. Now remember that last clause, that's the taking clause, it's the one that you use when agents of the state come in and rip off your goodies and don't pay you for them. We're going to cover that a little later when I show you how to draft a complaint. But right now what I want to show you is the grand jury business because this is my favorite. I doubt very seriously, and I'm saying this in all modesty, if there's anybody that knows what I know about a grand jury. And I can't, you know, unfortunately this is not a grand jury seminar. But here's what I can teach you. A grand jury can be used offensively or defensively. Now, what you can do is, is if you can show a federal judge, and you kind of have to beat him over the head with it, that you are not indicted by a properly constituted and unbiased grand jury, then the federal court has no jurisdiction and they're supposed to let you wiggle loose. Now, I've had a couple cases like this. In fact, the fellows I was having lunch with, I was explaining to them, I had a case out in San Diego that this fellow was going to be indicted and we mounted a preemptive strike and it scared the United States attorney so bad that he basically just backed off everyone else in the case, uh, pled guilty, went down, got locked up or whatever. And he's still wandering around loose and they're basically trying to figure out what they're going to do with him because we used it offensively. And here's how you do that. I'm going to give you a specific statute. That once you read this statute, you're going to see how deadly this is. And then I'm going to give you the evidence on this statute. And that's, that statute is this. It's Title 18. It's part of the United States Criminal Code, and it's section 3332, paragraph A. And if you want to see how it works, the best case on this is in the 617th volume 
of the federal supplements and it's page 199. You want to see how this statute works. What this is is that if you decide that someone has committed a federal offense and you know what the federal offense is and I let me caution you a federal offense is not somebody shot your dog there has to be a series of numbers somewhere in Title 18 or Title 26 or Title 21. And if you decide that you want to go in front of a federal grand jury and snitch all over somebody committing federal offenses such as federal agents, this statute mandates that the United States Attorney allow you to present evidence to a federal grand jury. Now, we had a case down in uh, Missouri, uh, Peter Simpson, had a state judge who was violating a couple of uh, federal statutes in his case and in my case I don't snitch on just anybody. Uh, I got tossed out of the Eighth Circuit Court of Appeals on a libel action against Popular Mechanics magazine for uh, it was a trade libel case against a carburetor that I manufacture, the old fish carburetor and I felt that what the judges in the Eighth Circuit did would be classified as obstruction of justice, which you will find under Title 18, Section 1503 and 1505. Those are what are called omnibus statutes, which means that anybody who interferes in any way with your access to anything you're entitled to in a federal court proceeding, you've already got to have the thing going, uh, you're, you're basically, when someone does that, let me back up here, when someone interferes with you in a federal court proceeding, that's a federal offense. Now. These particular statutes, this may, they may not look like much. This is the statute that you use to use a grand jury offensively. You go into the grand jury and say, hey, I want an indictment. I want this guy charged with this, and then I want you to put him on trial, and I want you to make sure that, because if he gets in front of a petty jury, they're going to lock him up anyway. Uh, and then this is the case. It's called in grand jury application. That's the case you need to read. Now. This statute is apparently more deadly than we had imagined because Peter and I filed a complaint. What we did was we wrote the United States attorneys in St. Louis, Missouri, and Springfield, Missouri, respectively. And of course, we didn't get the time of day. These are arrogant bureaucrats. So they just blew us off. So we then wrote to Janet Reno and said, look, lady, these turkeys will not follow the statute. They won't let us go into the grand jury and snitch all over these judges. That's our right under the statute, okay? So by writing to Janet Reno, what that did was that took us out of the state of Missouri and we now had a cause of action against Janet along with these two U.S. attorneys because what I wanted to do is I wanted to get it into the D.C. courts which are nowhere near as corrupt as the ones in Missouri. Well, the end result of this was is that her attorney, a fellow named Sam McCann, I've talked to him on the phone twice, and he didn't sound like a bad guy. In fact, um, when uh, we talked, uh, I think it was about the second time, I said, you know, McCann, I said, you don't sound like um, you belong there in D.C. And he said, why is that? I said, because you don't sound like a bureaucratic intransigent asshole. And uh, he kind of laughed. And uh, anyway, uh, Peter's got a copy of the complaint that we did there. It was a fairly simple one. Well, he got three extensions of time from a federal judge who apparently actually knew how to do his job named Stanley Sporkin. And, you know, I got to tell you sometimes this is the luck of the draw. And after the three extensions of time, they still hadn't answered our complaint. They still hadn't said, hey, we're going to let you in front of the grand jury. So the next thing I did is I filed a motion for summary judgment saying if these people are going to answer, how about letting us have what we asked for? And lo and behold, all, uh, all discombobulated and trying to do two things at once. But what Judge Sporkin says is, is that you've had enough extensions of time. And he's talking to Janet Reno here. I mean, we're not talking about just any, you know, bureaucratic bimbo. I mean, this is the number one bimbo, okay? <laughs> anyway, he tells her that if she doesn't get off dead center and answer this thing, that he's going to impose sanctions against her. In other words, I'm going to have an autographed check from Janet Reno. It's going to go right up in my trophies with you know, whatever federal judges I can scrape off the bench. We're going to get the relief requested, and we're going to have summary judgment granted. That's just this statute here and another one I want to acquaint you with from Title 28. Now, I'm going to show you how to lay this out here in, in, a, in a very short period of time, but remember this other statute. 
It's this one right here. That is the statute that you use. This is Title 28, Judiciary and Judicial Procedure, Title 18, Crimes and Criminal Procedure. You'll find it in West United States Code Annotated in the library. How to locate that is in part of your course materials in the Brown's Lawsuit Cookbook. You use this statute to invoke jurisdiction, and you use this one as the statutory right, and what you're asking the court to do is you're asking for jurisdiction here in order to make them do what they're supposed to do here, which they should have done in the first place. And of course, which they never do, because when you're dealing with United States attorneys, you are dealing with some real swine. And fortunately, they get thrown out every time the uh, uh, political parties change. They're not like federal judges. They're not in there for life. They get rid of them. Uh, for example, if you get a Republican president in next, you'll get all Republican United States attorneys. Then the time after that, you'll be probably back to Democrats. But at least you got a way to get rid of them with an election. Bear these two in mind. This one, in fact, this case here, it's worth Xeroxing and reading it over and over and over because once you see how to do this, and I couldn't believe how simple it was, um, and you start making moves like this, then you now have a way to get back at the people who are trampling all over your constitutional and statutory rights because bear this in mind that whenever anybody acting under color of law, now we're talking federal or state, tramples a right of yours, that's a federal offense. It's now a felony. You'll find it at Title 18, United States Code, Section 242, and the 241 is the conspiracy section of it. This is the criminal analog to all you people who are very fond of Title 42s. Now, United States Code, Section 1983. These two are the same thing. The difference is this is civil, this is criminal. The other difference is, is that this one, you cannot sue a judge for money damages, a state judge, but if you know how to do it, you can get him locked up. World of difference. All right now, let me get into uh, Amendment 6. I'm not going to do, do too much on the takings clause because we can cover that later as we get into individual cases. But on Amendment 6, in all criminal prosecutions, the accused shall enjoy the right to a speedy and public trial by an impartial jury of the state and district wherein the crime shall have been committed, which district shall have been previously ascertained by law, and to be informed of the nature and cause of the accusation, to be confronted with the witnesses against him, to have compulsory process for obtaining witnesses in his favor, and to have the assistance of counsel for his defense. Now, remember what I asked you earlier? Why do we have to have this impartial jury clause of the Sixth Amendment when we have a guarantee of trial by jury under Article Three in the main body of the Constitution? Anybody want to nibble on that one? Anybody want to give it a shot? Gentlemen back here, come on up to the microphone uh, so we can hear you. All right. Okay, now tell me, what's, what's the deal? Just to try, the Constitution itself pertains to everybody within the executive, legislative, and judicial branch of government, and the Bill of Rights pertains to everybody outside of that. All the, all the people that didn't have the authority, or don't have any authority or any rights under the Constitution itself. Okay, that's a nice try, but unfortunately like it's I incorrect. Said. Would anybody else like to try? Okay. <sighs> Okay, Al, you want to try. Is the magic word impartial? The magic word is impartial. Would you like to explain it to the audience? <laughs> well, it sounds like uh, under the Constitution it says you are entitled to a jury. Yeah. But it, doesn't say, but, it, but it doesn't say that it has to be an impartial jury. Define what they mean by impartial. <sighs> Probably somebody who's not making any money off the federal government <laughs> and uh, doesn't have any relatives that's making any money off the federal government doesn't stand to make any more. Uh, well, nice try, but unfortunately, you're, you're also not correct, okay? How many people here right now are not familiar with jury nullification? Okay, you're not familiar with jury nullification yet? Okay, jury nullification, make it real brief, that's the ability of the jury to say not only uh, are the facts such that we should not convict this guy, but the law stinks, and we don't have to apply the law either. Now, if you go all the way back, the Sparf and Hansen versus United States Supreme Court case from 1895, 
they define in the dissenting opinion what impartial jury means. The jury trial they guaranteed in the body of the Constitution meant that the judge could tell you what the law was. You must obey the laws I give it to you. But impartial jury meant from 1791 all the way up the, the first 50 years of the Republic, they didn't even have to define it because everybody knew what it meant. It meant that the jury had the right not only to judge the facts, but they could acquit in the face of the law. In other words, they were impartial between the individual and the state. The magic word, Al, Al Dask was completely right, is impartial, but the meaning is, is in the body of the Constitution, the judges could tell you what the law was and how you were supposed to follow it, but impartial meant that they absolutely could not. And this was true until 1895, until all the people who had originally been around when the Constitution, the Bill of Rights was enacted, had died off, and a century later, here, what we have is we have, uh, you know, the, the Nine Stooges, or whatever you want to call them, uh, they decide that, well, we cannot have juries deciding whether the law is worth enforcing or not. Do you realize how many federal gun laws would go down the toilet if juries were told, hey, you don't have to convict here. You can vote your consciences. You can say, this law stinks. I'm not going to enforce it. That isn't what they're told. That is the primary difference, and that's why jury trial appears twice in the federal constitution, once in the body, once in the Sixth Amendment. The meaning in the Sixth Amendment is not the same. Not at all. Okay? Now, Amendment 7, in suits at common law where the value in controversy shall exceed $20, the right of trial by jury shall be preserved, and no fact tried by jury shall be otherwise re-examined in any court of the United States than according to the rules of the common law. Now, a lot of people think, uh, have a question here? Yeah, I had one uh, back on, on number six. Okay. Nature. Nature and cause of the accusation. Right. Okay, what that means is, is that when you are faced with an indictment, it's a good question, when you're faced with an indictment and they're saying, you did such and such, that indictment must read as that you know, number one, you know what it is they're charging you with, number two, why they're charging you with it, and number three, it has to be drafted in such a fashion that if you had absolutely nothing to do with this particular situation, you could look at it and say, oh, okay, I know what they're charging me with. They don't do that. In fact, the worst of this is in some of these federal drug cases, possession with intent to distribute. I mean, you look at that and you don't know what the dickens they're going to try to prove. Now, what happens is, let me give you a little aside here, uh, show you how to beat a, uh, we've got one gentleman here, I'm not going to point him out, who's got a federal indictment wrapped around his neck right at the moment. But I'm going to show you how to beat almost any federal case in trial. Because under the nature and cause of the accusation, of the Sixth Amendment and the indictment by grand jury clause of the Fifth Amendment, you run into what's called a constructive amendment. And it works like this. When you go to trial and they have charged you with doing this, this, and this, and let's say they've charged you with three overt acts, all right? I'll give you a specific example. Had a case down in Florida, young man, they busted him for uh, marijuana growing, all right? And they charged him with two conspiracy counts and one charge of possession with intent to distribute. Now, since 1887, in a Supreme Court case that I mentioned earlier called Ex Part Bain, the prosecutor could not amend an indictment. In other words, you couldn't come out of the grand jury room with an indictment and then add another charge or write on it or scribble on it or do anything because that was an amended indictment. The minute it was amended, it was no longer an indictment by grand jury. Now, I know the state of Texas says they can do that, but they've never been challenged on it in federal court, or at least by anybody who knows what they're doing. Now, once they had that set down, that once it, the indictment is amended, it is no longer a grand jury indictment, the court loses jurisdiction. In 1960, in a case called Sterone versus United States, this guy was charged with one thing, but they proved something else. What that is called is a constructive amendment of the indictment. For example, the gentleman here who's got an indictment wrapped around his neck, he is charged with a conspiracy to defraud the United States. The indictment is so bad, they don't even say whether he's charged under Section A or B. A is a felony, B is a misdemeanor. The fellow I'm telling you about down in Florida, he went to trial. And you can always, always figure 10 more different ways to wiggle out of it if you take it to trial and if you just lay down and let them steamroll over the top of you with a guilty plea 
Because the minute you plead guilty, you've waived all the facts in the case, and <clears throat> even if everything that you pled guilty to was not a fact, you're stuck with it. Now you can only raise issues of law. But what they did with this character is here they had him on a three count indictment. He beat one of the conspiracy counts at trial and one third of the evidence that they brought in against him was for money laundering. But money laundering shows up no place on his indictment. That is called a constructive amendment. In other words, they're amending the indictment literally or in effect by bringing up charges that the grand jury never even considered even with the prosecution leading them around by the nose. That is a per se, automatic, absolute reversal in every case. It's automatic. You can run a Westlaw computer search on that, you'll come up with hundreds of cases, and in every single one where you have a criminal case and they have brought up evidence of a crime you were not charged with, it's just wham, bam, thank you, ma'am, it's an automatic reversal. There's, even, there's not even any argument about it. Uh, if they bring up evidence you weren't charged with on the same crime, yeah, sometimes you can wiggle out on what's called a, uh, a, a variance of the indictment. But any time, and bear this in mind, that you get charged in criminal court, if you can just keep it going long enough to where they bring in evidence about some crime the grand jury never even heard of, you're going to walk. You're going to get it reversed. It's going to be that simple. Okay, does that answer your nature and cause of the accusation well enough? Uh, close, but one of the things that there's been a lot of discussion about it locally on and is what does nature mean a, in terms of civil or criminal in, in the term of uh, whether a court has jurisdiction? Well I can answer that for you right off the bat. In the first place there is no such thing as nature and cause of the accusation in a civil case. The, civil ca the Sixth Amendment applies only to criminal. Mm -hmm. all right? And as far as the word nature goes it means just what it says. In other words, what's this all about? All right? The cause, how did this originate? It's that simple. See, what you've got to be careful, and I've warned everybody about this before, is you hear a lot of these things floating around and there's been a lot of discussion. My advice right. to everybody having these discussions is to go to the law library and look this stuff up and read it and see for themselves. Because, again, the law is not what I tell you it is. It's not what these people are telling you it is. Right. The law is what's in the books. That's and even then, sometimes, quite often, it's wrong. That's the answer I was looking okay, for. Okay, good. good. Finally, glad I got you satisfied. All right, now, we're to uh, Amendment 7, which I believe I already started on. Let me just backtrack. I'm not going to reread it. But when they're talking about trial by jury, uh, and it says, now, now bear this in mind, you do not automatically have a right of jury trial in anything you wander into in any federal court. And I'll tell you, one of the most deadly uh, is the sexual harassment suits. You don't get any jury trial in front of those, and those have become so bad that you're having women that somebody made a grab at that are collecting a million bucks, and they just go in front of a judge. Uh, so let me warn you, it says, let me emphasize, in suits at common law. If you want to find out what were suits at common law, you go right back to Prosser's Law of Torts. You go prior to 1689, you look at what the common law was, and that will tell you what a suit at common law was. Let's go to Amendment 8. Amendment 8 is excessive bail shall not be required, nor excessive fines imposed, nor cruel and unusual punishments inflicted. Well, excessive bail, that one in practice is a complete nullity because you'll find almost anybody in any criminal case, if a judge does not want him to get out of jail, he'll set the bail high enough where the guy can't make it. Excessive fines imposed, uh, you're going to find you can do something with that quite often, for example, uh, New York has a statute, it's an uh, environmental conservation law, and uh, I mean this statute is really draconian. If you spill anything as far as a hazardous substance or waste or anything, less than 99 gallons into the environment in New York State, you can be fined up to $25,000 a day. The statute is so bad is it does not define exactly what the, de the minimum is. For example, you could literally violate this statute by spilling three drops of three-in-one oil on the ground or by driving your automobile down the road and spewing pollutants out the tailpipe in just amounts that are already approved by the federal government. Uh, the Attorney General of the uh, state of uh, New York, the people I was helping on this, he admitted the statute was no good, it was unconstitutional for this reason, but we still have to run the gauntlet through the federal courts. 
Now, cruel and unusual punishments inflicted. Uh, there's a case called Harmelin versus, versus Michigan that pretty well tells you where this is. This fellow was driving around. I think he had about uh, three quarters of a kilo of nose candy in his car. He got life without possibility of parole. Took it to the Supreme Court, said it violated the Eighth Amendment. And Justice Scalia, who was a law professor, and uh, my advice to you is if he ever goes back to teaching law, stay out of that law school. The, one of the dissenting opinions pointed out that under Scalia's reasoning in this case, that a lifetime sentence was cruel but not unusual, that you could get a life sentence for having a parking ticket. And that's exactly what it says in the opinion, by the way. Let's go to Amendment 9. The enumeration in the Constitution of certain rights shall not be construed, construed to deny or disparage others retained by the people. Well, this is something nobody has ever used in a federal court because everyone who uses the Second Amendment, there was a real good law journal article written by a law professor that pointed out you don't even need the Second Amendment to argue a gun case, you can use the Ninth because there's no place in the Constitution where the federal government's given the ability to regulate weapons or disarm people. Amendment 10, the powers not delegated to the United States by the Constitution nor prohibited by it to the states are reserved to the states respectively or to the people. Well, that's a fairly decent amendment. The only problem is, is that uh, we lost it at Appomattox. In case you hadn't known, the states' rights kind of went down the, down the tubes back then. We're going now. Amendment 11, you cannot sue a state. People do this all the time. They, they try to sue a state, and here's where it gets tricky. When you're suing a state, the federal courts have construed this to mean you're not only suing the state, but if you sue a state agency for money damages, which if you win will come out of the public treasury, you're suing the state. You're dead in the water. What you can do is you can sue the states, even with the 11th Amendment, for declaratory and injunctive relief. In other words, you can ask the statute you want to use is this one right here. We're going to co probably come back to it. 2201, 2202. Now, what you also have, you've got to be careful here. I'm going to warn you, this can get a little tricky. Title 28, United States Code Section 2201, that's declaratory relief. 2202 is injunctive relief. This one, okay, you declare what the rights of the parties are. This one, you're asking the court to either make them stop doing something or to start doing something. These will not work by themselves. You normally have to wire in the general federal question statute, Title 28, United States Code, Section 1331, or everybody's favorite, Title 42, United States Code, Section 1983. We have one of these going against a state judge down in Missouri, and the attorney general for the state has thrown up this humongous smoke screen concerning um, the fact that you can't sue a judge for money damages, but we're not asking for money damages. If you sue a judge just asking the court to declare the rights of the parties, you've got a real good chance of getting away with it. Now, okay, we've got Amendment 11. Amendment 12, I'm not even going to, believe me, you don't want me to read this one, because this puppy, it's about electors in the states, it goes on and on and on and on. You want to read it, be my guest, read it on your own time. Amendment 13, neither slavery nor involuntary servitude, this is section 1, except as a punishment for crime whereof the party shall have been duly convicted, shall exist within the United States or any place subject to their jurisdiction, section 2. Congress shall have power to enforce this article by appropriate legislation. Now, there have been some people that have beat the, uh, the Brady Bill because the Brady Bill mandates uh, various law enforcement officers doing this and that. The only thing is, is the Brady Bill doesn't provide for paying these people for their labor. So nobody wanted under the Second Amendment or even the Ninth, they brought it under the Thirteenth and the federal government cannot make me if I'm a sheriff, fill out all their forms without paying me. And so it's already been tossed in a couple of uh, jurisdictions, and the odds are it's eventually going to go down in flames all over the country. Now, here we are on everybody's favorite, Amendment 14. Now, uh, you know, I don't want to embarrass anybody here, but is there anybody here 
who thinks that they are a citizen of the state in which they reside and they are not a citizen of the federal government. Anybody here think that? Nobody wants to admit to that? Huh? Like to believe it. You'd like to believe it. Okay. Let me introduce you to the real world here because I hear a lot of this. This idea that you're uh, not a, a citizen of the United States but only a citizen of the state you reside, unfortunately has not been true since 1868 when the amendment was ratified, except in California they didn't ratify it until May the 6th, 1959, so there you might have had an argument back in the 50s. Section 1, Amendment 14, all persons born or naturalized in the United States, comma, and subject to the jurisdiction thereof, comma, and we don't need to get into a long jurisdictional argument, I mean, uh, we already explained that earlier with the 44 Magnum, are citizens of the United States and of the state wherein they reside. Okay, in other words, you got dual citizenship wrapped around your neck in 1868, and there's just not a whole lot you can do about it, so any argument that is predicated on you're a citizen of the state and not of the United States, you're running head on into the language of the 14th Amendment. And I know some of you think, well, the 14th Amendment wasn't legally ratified, the 16th wasn't legally ratified. The problem that you have and there are court cases that address this, is that that is not a justiciable issue. In other words, once an amendment is ratified, no matter how it was done, the only way it can be unratified is through the political process. You can't go through the judiciary to say, this particular amendment to the Constitution is no good. That's a political question. Now, you can do that with a statute, which we may show you here later on. No state shall make or enforce any law which shall abridge the privileges or immunities of citizens of the United States, nor shall any state deprive any person of life, liberty, or property without due process of law, law nor deny to any person within its jurisdiction the equal protection of the laws. The uh, thing is, and you know, it's kind of funny because a lot of people think that, well, the 14th Amendment is just awful. Now, can anybody tell me the favorite statute that everybody likes as pro se litigants that is derived directly from the 14th Amendment, from that first section? Anybody want to hazard a guess? Any takers? Over here. Those two, you're all right there. Right here? Yep, man's absolutely correct. Throw him a fish. Okay, he's absolutely correct. Without the 14th Amendment, you would not have a Title 42, Section 1983 because one is a springboard of the other. Now, let's go all the way down here to the last section, because there's a lot of stuff in this 14th Amendment that, as far as you know, Section 4, the validity of the public debt of the United States, I mean, what do I care? I got my own debt I've got to worry about. But down in Section 5, the Congress shall have power to enforce by appropriate legislation the provisions of this article, the 14th Amendment. Again, that's where this comes. This is part of the appropriate legislation that was enacted under the 14th Amendment. Amendment 15, the right of citizens of the United States to vote shall not be denied or abridged by the United States or by any state on account of race, color, or previous condition of servitude. And you know, this might be the reason why they let ex-convicts vote now. You know, people who supposedly lost their uh, right to vote because they were punished for a crime, because about 30 years ago they finally just started repealing all those civil death statutes. Section 2 of Amendment 15, the Congress shall have power to enforce this article by appropriate legislation. Amendment 16, and this is what we're going to, this is the last of the amendments we're going to cover because the rest of them are just basically political mistakes like the 17th Amendment, the 18th Amendment, things like that. Now here's your, here's your favorite. The Congress shall have power to lay and collect taxes on incomes from whatever source derived without apportionment among the several states and without regard to any census or enumeration. So this was enacted in 1913, 16th Amendment. Now, can anybody tell me, and I've read you the entire 16th Amendment, about 13 years after the 13th Amendment was enacted, I believe it was around 1926, but don't quote me, all right? You know, I could be wrong a few years one way or the other. Congress enacted what we now know as the Internal Revenue Service statutes. Title 26, and they go all over the place. Now, would anybody like to hazard a guess as to what is wrong with all the criminal penalties 
In Title 26, I believe there's a couple of you here got wrapped up on a 7203 and other uh, <coughs> criminal statutes having to do with the income tax. Anybody want to hazard a guess with what is wrong with Congress enacting criminal statutes under the 16th Amendment? Any takers here? Go. Well, the 16th Amendment only authorized the ability to lay taxes, not to lay criminal penalties. Bingo. What Congress did was they amended the 16th Amendment by the enactment of criminal penalties. They changed the meaning. In other words, Congress never had any authority. The problem you're going to run into is that the federal courts have upheld this nonsense because what they've done, and they're very clever the way they've done it, if you trace back the, the court cases saying that the criminal penalties under that code were constitutional, what you'll find is, is the further back you go, the weaker the cases get. The fact is, Congress cannot, merely by legislating, amend the Constitution. That is precisely what they did under the 16th Amendment. Now, there's only one man that I know of that has actually won cases with this. I've never really tried, so I can't say I couldn't do it. I don't know at this point, but I do know of one individual who has. I'm not going to mention his name because, you know, he's kind of shy and retiring and he's got about 17 bullet holes in him and um, three of the bullets are still in him and he's won about oh, I think 75 gunfights and he's just not the kind of individual I want to irritate by throwing his name out on the street. Uh, but he has in a number of cases used that issue gone all the way back to the enactment of the uh, IRS codes as far as criminal penalties and as, as I understand it he's won quite a few cases like that. Now we're kind of getting low on time here on the uh, Constitution. I see Peter's got, he's given me three minutes. How about some questions here so we can wrap this up? Okay, up here, go. Uh, <laughs> Back to the good old 14th Amendment and having attended Richard McDonald seminars, etc., etc., um, the, the uh, legislative intent of the 14th Amendment was only to provide a vehicle for citizenship to the freed slaves uh, following the Dred Scott decision where, where it was said that they, they could not uh, attain citizenship, whether slave or not. Oh, is that what you believe? That. <laughs> okay. That, no, that's, I'm afraid that's not correct because the 14th Amendment, as I read from Adams, Adamson versus California, the dissenting opinion, what they were trying to do back then was make it so that the entire Bill of Rights, the First Amendment, the Second Amendment, the Third, Fourth, Fifth, Sixth, and everything would apply across the board to all citizens, not just freed slaves. Uh, the thing is, when you come up with a statement like that, what I would suggest you do is go back into the legislative history, read the congressional record from that era, and what you're going to find is a lot of what you're hearing cannot be substantiated by the record. Uh, next question. Yeah, is there any uh, success using the 13th Amendment e in civil or... Oh, yeah, I just told you, the Brady Bill. Yeah, there are people that have already tossed it. Ma'am, you're next. Yes. Here in Dallas with the IRS, they may not put you in prison on the IRS problems, but they'll hold you in contempt of court for whatever reason, and so you get prison anyhow. But uh, I wanted to ask you a question earlier in the session when you talked about the last federal judge who was you, removed from his bench, is that it, or... Raul Ramirez, I got him in December of 89. Yeah, what, what else would you okay. like to know? There was another federal judge. I wondered if you were familiar. He was appointed baseball commissioner. And Which did, one was that? I don't recall his name, but he did some wrongdoings with the baseball commission, from, from what I understand. And that surprises and, you? <laughs> <laughs> and maybe was, he was removed or sanctioned or something. Well, you'd have I to just, give me a name because I don't I just don't wondered know. if you recall it. No, uh, okay. the only federal judge I'm familiar with from around here, I believe was, his name was Porter. Uh, the same old man who uh, pulled this trick with the uh, Internal Revenue Service, I believe got Judge Porter committed uh, to a, for observation for substance abuse and uh, during his 90 days of commitment in some rest camp or whatever, they found not only was he a drunk, but he was a nose candy freak. And uh, the only positive thing I can say about it is when Judge Porter was in there, apparently he also died. So that was you know, one less problem we've got. We are the Erwin Rommel School of Law, and we can be accessed at 4842 North Magnolia, Chicago, Illinois. The postal code out on the street is 60640-4710. Our telephone for you number crunchers, 312-878-0681. Dedicated fax, 0682. Write us for our information pack, Michael Brown, Dwayne Rogers, and I 
are available as consultants on a fee basis. We can review your work or suggest alternatives. We're going to take a short break, and we hope you do too. Thanks for listening. And those of you who uh, want to see uh, what we've got, Janet Reno, I mean, the fact is I got this bimbo on the ropes, at least temporarily. Take 15. Thanks. Pass it around.